Hello, and welcome to the Duke Cardiology Conference. I'm Sunil Rao, Associate Professor of Medicine at Duke University Medical Center. Today's program is titled, The Evolution of the Coronary Stent, Addressing Current Limitations with New Designs. And our distinguished guest is Dr. Mitchell Krukoff, Professor of Medicine at Duke University Medical Center here in Durham, North Carolina. Mitch, thanks for joining me. Sunil, it's a pleasure to be here. It's interesting, you know, as coronary uh, PCI is one of the most commonly performed uh, procedures in the United States. And it almost seems as if we're starting to take stent designs for granted, but they're actually quite complex devices. And it appears that there's been a, quite an evolution in the design, and there's even more to come. So t tell us what you can about the coronary stent design. Well, Sunil, you're exactly right. On the one hand, coronary stents seem like simple things. They pry an artery open, and they're supposed to keep it that way. On the other hand, the actual cellular metabolism and biology of the artery and uh, hemostasis and thrombosis that are the, the enemies of these types of interventions all together have now combined in these almost microscopic and we're down to nanotechnology approaches to uh, how to get into a two to four millimeter vessel and, and create a beneficial biological intervention. Great. So now you've had some data for us, uh, historical and some things to look forward to. So why don't we get started? Great. Well, I thought I'd, I'd uh, actually refocus this in the sense of with new stent systems, when is a change really a change? Because on the user side, of course, we see a lot of new devices, our colleagues in Europe and outside the U.S. even more so. How much of this is just marketing versus how much of this is really more advanced science and the advance of medicine? So I thought I'd start with uh, the, the a priori rule of breakthrough technology. And there's no question that stents relative to balloons and drug eluting stents relative to bare metal stents have been breakthrough technologies. They've changed our practice of medicine. But we have to remember the a priori rule of breakthrough technologies is that the first generation is always the worst generation. So any heart valve, pacemaker, stent, balloon catheter, the first one is always the biggest, the most cumbersome. It changes the way we practice, but they get smaller and sleeker and more efficient over time. But with the a priori rule that the first is always the worst, there are two corollary rules. One is just because it's new doesn't mean it's better, and the other is to expect the unexpected. So with drug eluting stents, it was a very exciting era in the first data from Brazil to see an artery 12 months later that looked like you had just put the stent in. And I think with the first cipher, uh, first in man reports, everyone's excitement level reached a very high level. And actually in the randomized pivotal data, the Sirius study, the Texas 4 data, and the Endeavor 2 study, which compared new drug eluting stent platforms to pre-existing bare metal stent platforms, the very consistent reduction in restenosis and, and uh, the need for repeat intervention, instant restenosis, a 70% treatment ballpark is certainly enormous in cardiovascular. 15% therapeutic benefit is high. 70% was a new era, a breakthrough technology. But only a few years later, the expect the unexpected broke through. And with reports at the European Society of Cardiology in 2006, concerns were raised from Basket Lade and other that for every five to seven prevention of restenosis procedures that we were benefiting with these drug eluting first generation stents, were we paying a price of anywhere from two to three ST elevation MIs and deaths with stent thrombosis. So that raised us a, a different kind of alarm, a safety related issue, and then a much longer term kind of framework. In fact, the Byrne Rotterdam group followed patients out uh, in a continuous ongoing registry longitudinally. Out to three to four years, it looked like there was a linear hazard of about 0.6% that persisted over that time in drug eluting stent first generation patients. Now, 0.6%, we even devices try to duck that number maybe in a lot of settings. But with drug eluting stents, these are permanent coronary implants. Sitting here today, we have more than 10 million human beings worldwide with these stents permanently implanted in their hearts. So in that setting, 0.6% uh, per year hazard is 60,000 ST elevation MIs and deaths a year. So at a public health level, we can't ignore this. Plus, 
As an interventional cardiologist, we're growing this population by about 750,000 to a million a year. And we don't just have one or two new stent designs coming in. In fact, again, our colleagues overseas uh, are now looking at more than 25 different drug-looting stent platforms. So how do we tell amongst these various design features, various design objectives, as you change different pieces, and the very varying amount of data that come along with these gadgets? Are any two of these really equivalent, the same, or is one kind of modification actually better? Or is it possible we make modifications that make things worse? Mitch, with the 2006 <clears throat> earth-shaking presentation of these results, did it change the frame of reference uh, for clinicians and for, for regulatory bodies? I mean, you've been part of the uh, coronary stent world for a long time. Were, was it, were the safety concerns with bare metal stents back when they were first introduced in the mid-90s different than the safety concerns now with drug-eluting stents? Or has it always been about stent thrombosis? It's just more of a focused issue now. No, ironically, it was almost the opposite. I think when bare metal stents first emerged, there were more safety concerns. Mm -hmm. And we were using Coumadin and Heta starch and all sorts of cocktails, in fact, to, to deal with our safety concerns mm -hmm. initially and long-term with these stents going to erode through the artery, all sorts of safety concerns that, in fact, largely did not turn out to be true. In the DES era, I think it was kind of the reverse. Mm -hmm. We thought the miracle was here. These were the perfect products. People were talking about stenting 20 and 30 percent lesions because you could characterize them as lipidic. So it was almost preventive stenting mm -hmm. that we were discussing mm -hmm. until the concern was stent thrombosis. Do you think we got complacent? Uh, I, I think, unfortunately, the word is arrogant. And mm -hmm. yeah, I think we did. Mm -hmm. Interventional cardiologists tend to do that. <laughs> so as we compare DES platforms, Sunil, I think we have to think about what are the endpoints that we're actually comparing. A lot of them are mechanical. How long a stent can I get off the shelf? What diameter of vessel am I trying to cover? How deliverable is this platform? Can I get it where I need to get it without having to macerate the artery up and down? Is the delivery system an important part of the package if the balloon overhangs or if the stent comes off the balloon? What about side branches? What about radial strength for osteo lesions, et cetera? In addition, though, to the mechanical endpoints, we have biological and ultimately, most importantly, clinical endpoints. So biologically, can I inhibit mitotic reproduction and late loss? Can I avoid restenosis? Can I biologically allow still for healing of the endothelium and other tissues that will avoid stent thrombosis? And can I restore normal reactivity to a blood vessel that's used to being flexible, not, not rigid? And of course, clinically, can I relieve angina? Can I avoid or prevent MIs? Can I reduce death? So in all of this complexity, I actually find it very helpful to step back and look at new stent designs and comparing stent designs, frankly, the way the FDA does. To the FDA, a drug eluting stent is a combination product. It is a device that delivers a drug. And the device that delivers a drug has three basic components. The stent platform. The platform, of course, is different material compositions, mm -hmm. strep thickness, different surface area, et cetera. The second component is the polymer. That's really the plastic that allows us to load drug onto these steel bodies for, for the large part. And finally, the drug. Uh, the limus or other drugs that inhibit mitotic reproduction. And there's been some work with uh, some exotic drugs to lower inflammation and even directly inhibit thrombosis. We have to remember it's not just the dose of drug, though, that it's also the kinetics of drug delivery, and I'll give an example of that. So if you line all of this up, in fact, there are a gajillion permutations as to how you could advance designs and stents. And uh, by changing the material, the design of the platform, the polymer, the drug, or various combinations, keeping some pieces the same, changing other pieces. So how do we get our arms around this kind of evolution? Well, let's look at some examples of, for instance, first the stent platform. And as we look at a stent platform, in fact, well, from the bare metal era, we know there are lots of places that engineers can tweak bare metal platforms, the material, how thick it is, the space or, or uh, cell width, and, and on and on to make them more flexible, to add surface area, to add radial strength. 
as we compare these different uh, kinds of stent designs and platforms, to what degree each of these affects curvature or the ability of the stent to adapt to the vessel rather than making the vessel adapt to the stent, to avoid tissue prolapse in between cells that are too large or as they bend around bends, to at, allow side branch access. But we also have to keep in mind that in addition to all of these sort of mechanical elements, this is the drug delivery system. Drug from a drug looting stent is delivered by square surface uh, area that is the surface of the delivery platform. So if we deform the delivery platform, it's not only a side branch entry point, it's a shift in the density of drug delivered. So this seems to me like a complex pachinko game, really. As you manipulate one aspect of it, something else will change at the same time. So it's not really just a matter of manipulating one. You've got to pay attention to the other uh, pieces as well. Is that, is that a fair statement? I, I hope that comes out as the, the most central theme to everything we're going to talk about today. And I think that's why I really embrace the FDA's approach, that it's a combination product. Mm -hmm. where appreciating the role of each element is not isolated, mm -hmm. but is in the context of how it changes the performance of the whole product. So stent materials uh, uh, vary quite a bit from the early stainless steel. We now have co mostly cobalt chromium available in the U.S. Platinum has been added as a higher density uh, material. This affects whether you can see the stent, the radio opacity, whether it recoils once you expand it with a balloon relative to the plaque, whether there's more or less likelihood of strut fracture, and at the end of the day, this may also play a role in stent thrombosis. Mm -hmm. Certainly the shift from generation one on the left to generation two on the right stents, the shift from stainless steel to cobalt chromium was a shift in strut thickness. And actually not just as a more deliverable, more flexible shift, but as a shift that uh, might be associated with lower restenosis was a lesson learned in the bare metal era. And in fact, the SCAR registry, the data shown here from Sweden's uh, national registry, makes it very clear that just bare metal stents, which are all shown here, have different restenosis rates. And there is an interesting clustering, higher and lower restenosis rates around the strut thickness. We also have to keep in mind that lessons learned from bare metal are, are not done. We still use bare metal stents, not only in patients who uh, may not tolerate dual antiplatelet therapy, but there are very novel bare metal designs, a stint on a wire. We've got at least two of those coming down the pipe. And most of the initial platforms that are dedicated bifurcation stints mm -hmm. are themselves bare metal in their first construct. So bare metal designs are still very much with us, and the basic principles of what makes them better certainly are still a, a big part of our clinical practice and interest. But in drug looting stints, there's another possible role to thinner stress, and that is not in the ability to create radial force and reduce restenosis, but an actual to augment healing. And there's animal data that's actually very compelling that a thicker strut is a taller mountain for endothelial cells to cover. And the completeness of endothelialization, I think we all suspect in human subjects is an important part of healing, of covering those struts. So thinner struts in a DES platform may have another role above and beyond what we've seen in bare metal stents. So how does this really translate into the total package? We have a little bit of interesting data that I think has some questions and maybe some answers. Uh, the comparisons, for instance, of the Taxus Express, so Paclitaxel Illusion, versus the Taxus Liberté, same drug, same dose, same kinetics of delivery, same polymer. But as we go from the Express stainless steel to the Liberté much thinner platform, what does that look like? And Mark Turco and colleagues in the Atlas study uh, compared this historically in a prospectively styled comparison to a registry with the Taxus uh, uh, Liberté. And frankly, as we look at the one-year outcomes and angiographic difference, it doesn't look very different. So in a drug eluding stint, does the strut thickness matter to restenosis as much as it does to a bare metal stint? Hmm. Maybe. That's interesting. So, you know, certainly it's one study, but it's very interesting because it does indicate maybe the advantage of the thinner stretch, do you think, is flexibility and deliverability more so than great, you know, a little additional bang for the buck in terms of restenosis? Uh, I, I think there's no question that deliverability matters to all of us, mm -hmm. and, and this is a more flexible uh, type of platform. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we really can't tell from these 
data is whether it's safer because stent thrombosis right. over three years is not reflected in yeah. these kind of patient populations mm -hmm. and cohorts. Interesting. So similarly, we're now seeing an even thinner than cobalt chromium strep uh, diameter, 32 thousandths of an inch by the use of platinum, which is the highest density metal uh, of, of all stent platforms. Uh, very nice and radio opaque, very thin in Boston Scientific's platinum uh, chromium or element platform. Although here too, very interestingly, when you take the element platform, the thinnest possible struts, compared to the Taxus Express, which is the thickest stainless steel, but with the same dose of paclitaxel and the same polymer on the outside, at least the clinical outcomes that have been compared from the Perseus study, frankly, look pretty identical. So what's the benefit? Deliverability, maybe that's good, but does it translate into a clinical or a biological benefit? Again, long-term safety, you can't tell, yeah. but short-term doesn't look like very much. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, what if we take two equally thin strep stents that are different packages and compare them head-to-head? -head? So this is Zions V versus Texas Liberté, which Peter Smith and colleagues in the Netherlands uh, randomized in the COMPARE trial, about 900 patients in each group, and head-to-head -head two thin strut, different package stents, significant difference within one year, both in MACE rates and in target lesion revascularization. So I think it's safe to say that in the drug looting stent world, thinner struts may help with deliverability. Mm -hmm. Thinner struts alone don't seem to rock the platform although the real question of do they endothelialize better is still very hard to tell. Mm -hmm. What if we take metal away altogether? Mm -hmm. And we are seeing a number of worldwide uh, uh, programs that focus on a completely bioresorbable polymer. Uh, the leading of those right now is in the ABSORB program. And I have to say, it's pretty amazing to look at a cross-section of a porcine vessel at two years and see struts, and at three years see nothing compared to what we see in durable metal platforms. So this is a change, but it's a complex change because now as the whole stent dissolves, it's not only giving out uh, the drug as a drug delivery system, but it's structurally going to lose its support over time. And how much time and how fast is, is uh, going to still produce clinical results? We have some new and complex questions. How long do you need the scaffolding side of the stent to persist? Looks like it has to be at least three months, although my guess is we've got a lot to learn. What's equally fascinating, as Patrick Soroy's and colleagues have reported in The Lancet a couple of years ago, the vascular biology of these arteries several years downstream starts to look pretty normal. So that's another exciting downstream effect. But uh, one of the interesting things in watching the ABSORB program was just in the change in the design of the platform itself. So now we're in this exotic, bioabsorbable polymer world, but the same old message, more open cells in cohort A versus more closed cells or more uh, surface area coverage in cohort B really changes the late loss. So the yellow dots here mm -hmm. are the cohort A, the original bioabsorbable stent design. The red dots are the newer cohort B, more surface area, and the blue triangles are the uh, Zions V stent, which I think right now we could say is pretty much the gold standard. Mm -hmm. So you can see the leftward shift here just by changing the surface area coverage and the design of the platform, even in this kind of advanced technology of bioabsorbable stents, matters, and, and matters even in a drug-leading stent platform. So let's go to part two, the polymer. The polymer, I think, we, we recognize on the one hand is how you put drug onto a piece of metal mm -hmm. and can load it so that it will then elute and how you can affect the elution. It's also got its own tricky sides to manufacturing when you crimp the stent, when you sterilize it on a package, the shelf life, and certainly long term, a lot of concerns about polymer creating inflammatory reactions, allergic reactions, and creating non-healing environments mm -hmm. that ultimately support stent thrombosis downstream. These are sort of the, the universe of polymer to date. What we see now going forward are more biocompatible, durable polymers, as well as designs with bioabsorbable and lower doses of polymer, as well as zero polymer systems. So sometimes we overlook the manufacturing side, but this gets back to your point, that these are really exquisitely delicate 
complex pieces of technology. They don't look like it when you take them out of the package, but getting there, just manufacturing a polymer-covered stent and then crimping it on a balloon so it'll actually stay there by the hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. lots and then shipping them out sterile to cath labs all over the world, whether that polymer flakes or breaks, whether if you scrape it over a, a calcified lesion, it erodes, this is the delivery system. So anything that's irregular about the polymer also means that the drug delivery becomes heterogeneous rather than homogeneous within the plaque that you're stenting. And these kinds of pictures from Anu Vermani and colleagues at CVPath have, have also woken us up not only from animals, which these are taken from rabbits, uh, but uh, from humans subjects who come to autopsy. The, the granulomas, the inflammatory reactions that go with stent thrombosis that seem to really centralize around or be stimulated by early polymer designs have gotten all of our attention. So the newer generation of polymers uh, at least seem to, while still being durable, be much more focused on utilizing materials that are well established in blood systems from other product lines as non-provocative and that are much more commensurate with consistent manufacturing so they don't web and crack and, and flake along the way. And whether that really is, for instance, with the Zions here compared to Taxus and Spirit 4 by Peter Stone and colleagues, by, sorry, Greg Stone and colleagues, um, the, the reduction in stent thrombosis rate that's already evident in the first year is that driven by this advance in polymer compared to Generation 1, mm -hmm. certainly suggestive that that may be part of the picture. The uh, Medtronic program bringing forward the Endeavor stent, the other second generation stent, at least we have here in the United States, started with a biocompatible PC technology polymer, again, with great attention to this, combined with a new molecular entity, Zotarolimus, on a very thin strut cobalt chromium driver platform. And in fact, as Laura Mori presented to the FDA in, in their uh, panel presentation, when you look out to three years of stent thrombosis rates compared to all available information on bare metal, stents with the driver that looked very encouraging that at least this was a safe combo product and again you have to ask is the polymer a part of the reason mm -hmm. that that's safer. What was uh, noteworthy though was that the late loss with the Endeavor stent was not as good as the first generation stents. So one mechanism at least for why they might be safer might be you're just covering up the struts with some degree of mitotic tissue and fibroblast that's not actually just allowing healing to occur. So essentially reducing the amount of thrombogenic surface because you're... You're covering it up. So again, it becomes, I guess, a balance between restenosis uh, or, I guess, neointimal proliferation, really, and the safety issues. Exactly. And in fact, in the second part of this story, which we haven't seen in the United States yet, but the rest of the world has, the, the next step to address that was by taking this biocompatible polymer construct and manipulating the hydrophilicity hmm. and hydrophobicity mm -hmm. of the polymer so that you could take the exact same amount of zotarolimus but deliver it over a longer period of time. And that's the Endeavor Resolute. That's the next generation mm -hmm. of product. So again, what Endeavor Resolute does is by just changing the polymer, it's the same stent platform and metal. It's the identical dose of the same drug, zotarolimus but it now changes the kinetics of drug delivery to a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, as Ian Meredith and colleagues reported at four months and then out at a year, this dramatically improved the late loss. But the question then comes up, well, are these bigger lumens still safe mm -hmm. if part of the endeavor safety was that you covered the struts? So is safety preserved? And we can get a first look, I think, as Siggy Silber and colleagues have just reported in The Lancet, the two-year follow-up from the Resolute All Comers trial. This is more than 2,000 patients randomized head-to-head -head between Zions V, the Everolema saluting platform, and Endeavor Resolute. All Comers, complex population, wonderful study. And when you look at what they used as both a patient-related outcome, a mm -hmm. clinical MACE-like outcome, and a stent-related outcome, a target vessel failure-related outcome, that you can't even tell the difference between the two lines, between these two platforms. However, 
when you look at stent thrombosis, not statistically significant, but the resolute stent thrombosis rate is almost double, 1.9% versus 1.0. So have we really got the answer? Did these bigger lumens uncover something as they open? And I think we have to be vigilant. Another good illustration of how some great ideas don't always pan out quite the way we expect was the COSTAR, cobalt chromium stent. This is the only bare metal stent platform in the DES world that was never designed to be a bare metal stent. This was designed to be a drug delivery system. And the drug delivery mechanism are these holes or wells within the cobalt chromium struts that are filled very precisely with bioabsorbable PLGA polymer that can be loaded with drug. So the cool idea here was there's no polymer at all on the surface of this thing. Mm -hmm. And as you look at pigs uh, in seven days, you can see the, the, the PLGA filling each well. By 180 days, there is nothing. This is basically a bare metal platform. So this far and away was less exposure to polymer, both acutely at the implantation point and over time by becoming a bare metal stent. However, in what was at the time the largest randomized DES study done head-to-head -head between paclitaxel eluting COSTAR and the TAXAS stent, which was the COSTAR-2 study, in fact, the device could not perform at the level of the TAXAS stent. And it may have had to do in a root cause analysis ultimately in a manufacturing process that underloaded the cells. So we're going to see this come back as it was acquired by Johnson & Johnson and mm -hmm. the Sirolimus eluding now called Nevo platform. And there'll be a round two, because I happen to think this is a cool design. Mm -hmm. But the data made it clear yeah. that we had not achieved in the whole package of the design something that was any better than a first generation. In fact, not non-inferior. You have to bite your tongue just not to say <laughs> it's inferior yeah. to the first generation. But again, it's because of the one variable, perhaps, it's, it's the dosing that seem to affect the clinical outcomes where you held everything else pretty much constant. Exactly. Interesting. Okay, so other uh, sort of interesting designs out there that at least have their eye on the United States. We might see them someday. They're, they're certainly out and about in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, the Biomatrix stent platform uses an abluminal-only polymer cover. So this idea, you, when you embed the stent, the blood side is exposed to bare metal. The abluminal polymer itself is actually a bioabsorbable PLA, so very nicely broken down to carbon dioxide and water over time, and that is the stent delivery system that in about six months to a year becomes a bare metal stent. In the uh, leaders study, which was, again, I love this design. It's an all-comers design, head-to-head -head randomized, about 1,600 patients against Cypher, published in the Lancet a couple of years ago. They looked and, and recently reporting the two-year outcomes, not, not, again, rocking the universe, but the two-year outcomes look pretty good for clinical behavior and for stent thrombosis. They numerically look like maybe there's something going on here with this bilimus eluding stent that is right thinking in terms of design, abluminal, bioabsorbable, low blood exposure. And then there's another sort of handful of designs that used no polymer at all. And these were uh, born, I think, at the time when polymer really was the main concern for mm -hmm. stent thrombosis, et cetera. So these are all essentially designs that center around etching the surface of a bare metal and creating little pockets or pores whose surface tension can be used by spraying drug on. And mm -hmm. as the drug dries, enough of it is there that you can get it into a coronary and have it elute. The trouble is that controlling the rate of elution without a polymer mm -hmm. is a challenge. And basically, you get a burst effect, as we're seeing from uh, drug eluting balloons, for instance. So you get a lot more early drug delivery compared to, uh, to a, a polymer-based drug delivery system. The BioFreedom uh, device is probably the most advanced in terms of data. And here, the data are really quite preliminary, just four-month and 12-month observations. But compared to the Taxus Liberté. And the observations are sort of encouraging, certainly in, in terms of angiographic instant light loss. Looks like you can inhibit mitotic expression in a small handful of patients. The clinical data, of course, is meaningless with these small numbers. There are almost are no events in these kind of small numbers. So some work to do. But again, interest in moving away from polymer altogether if we can control elution. And here, 
What's interesting about the BioFreedom program is the use of another new molecular entity, Biolimus A9, which of all of the Limus and Paclitaxel drugs that are in the stent universe right now is far and away more, lipophilicity, more lipophilic than any other. And maybe in a burst kind of delivery environment, that's a good combination. We'll see. But that takes us into the last leg here, which is really what is the drug that you put on these and largely, these are mTOR inhibitors in the Limus family that we've seen. Many of these, like Serolimus and Everolimus. Paclitaxel, a very different kind of drug, a tubulin binding agent. But all of these are drugs that have been used widely in organ and transplant uh, rejection uh, inhibition. So we know a lot about the toxicity systemically of these drugs. On the other hand, we have two new molecular entities, Zoterolimus and Bilimus A9, that have not been used for anything in human subjects except drug eluting stents. And again, with drugs, it's not just the drug, but the dose response curve, where do you get toxicity, and recognizing that not only can fast delivery of a lot of drug be toxic, but we have other mechanical ways of creating high dose, and interventionalists need to keep this in mind. When we overlap two stents, you double the dose. This is square surface area direct drug delivery. When we do a crush, you triple the dose. So toxicity and dose response curves matter as we get into some of these other uh, key applications. Bilimus, again, new molecular entity, very lipophilic, some interesting uh, applications. Right now, I think Everolimus has everybody's attention, not so much that it's an exotic drug. It's actually a well-known drug, a minor analog of Serolimus, mm -hmm. but probably because in the Zines V and Promis platform, where it's been commercialized around the world and even here in the U.S., this is the lowest dose load of any drug eluting stent platform. So as you overlap Zion stents or even crush, does that give us a little more room in a dose toxicity curve? Again, more of a question than an answer, but an interesting feature as we look at ultimately things like stent thrombosis rates compared to paclitaxel where we know, in fact, the FDA obliged Boston Scientific to relabel the taxa stent with a caution about overlap, mm. because overlap seemed to generate, as paclitaxel has a very steep dose response curve, some, some adverse events. So uh, just to point to one other exotic, a fourth dimension. So we have three components, the stent, the polymer, the drug. There is a, a device out there that's been released in Europe that has a fourth dimension, which is EPC capture. Mm -hmm. So the genus stent, now, as a stainless steel, soon to be a cobalt chromium platform, in the drug eluting version, there's a bare metal version already in the market. They will use a novel polymer that's bioresorbable and only on the abluminal surface to deliver serolimus. And then on the endoluminal surface, they have a CD34 antibody. And what this uh, interesting biologic layer does is essentially act as a cell magnet to circulating endothelial progenitor cells. And what is fascinating, certainly in animals, is that you can see endothelialization of the struts of this stent, not in months or weeks or days, but in hours <laughs> from the time you implant these things. Now, are these cells really protective? Are they functional? Again, a lot of work to do, but another sort of dimension, if you will, because this is now a four component combination product. So at the end of the day, I, I think uh, we, we have to step back and say, in this type of complexity with all this orchestra of, of theatrical pieces that can be put together in so many ways, how do you tell the difference has got to ultimately come down to where's the data? Mm -hmm. So where do we have the largest patient numbers mm -hmm. so we can understand the safety kinds of features that are rare events, but STEMIs and deaths are catastrophic events. And a lot of the engineering we've just walked through are really geared to improving safety as much or more than efficacy. Where do we have complex patient cohorts, not just simple patients in randomized trials so that we can understand how it relates to our daily real world practice? And ultimately, again, where do we have follow-up that's not just nine months or a year, but that is a little more than that? And here, I think you have to grant a winner is, is with the everolimus based platform on the cobalt chromium uh, vision in, uh, with the durable fluorinated copolymer. So this is a durable, but biologically pretty inert and manufacturing-wise, very smooth sort of polymer to deal with. 
that is the Zion Sir Promise platform. And here, we now have uh, four-year reports, again from Greg Stone and colleagues, that the MACE difference compared head-to-head -head in randomized trials between generation one and generation two. In SPIRIT three, fairly simple patients. In SPIRIT four, more complex patients. In Zion's USA, real-world patients that there's data, at least, that we can examine and see that at four years, the MACE difference seems to hold out. You could argue about whether that's really the same versus widening at all. Similarly, with target lesion failure, holding out to four years. So both a patient-oriented endpoint and a stent or device-oriented endpoint, you, you have to say that this is more information, almost 4,000 patients in this one four-year cohort. Um, and going forward here, too, we can follow rarer events like stent thrombosis. And again, out to two years in SPIRIT4, now we are, again, out at about 4,000 patients. Uh, the difference from generation to one to generation two, at least there's data to uh, reassure us that this is a real difference, not just design features. I've had the wonderful pleasure of working with Jim Hermeller here in the United States in the post-market study, the Zions v. USA collection of 5,000 and now soon to be 8,000 patients, real world, all comers, all treated with science uh, or ever all in a saluting sense. And I think the most exciting thing we're seeing from these data as the FDA prospectively asked us to look at safety in the real world is that in these patients overall, interruption of dual antiplatelet therapy after six months, there are no stent thromboses. Is this proof that everybody heals? Of course not. Is this proof that we can drop back to six months of dual antiplatelet therapy? No, it is not. But it is a suggestion, I think, that we're on the right track and that this at least is a combination product that uh, for patient care and patient use is different in the second generation than the first. So to conclude, Sunil, I'd say, you know, Engineering and design objectives are the key to better and safer drug eluting stents, and these are complex devices that have some of the most advanced technology in polymers and pharmacokinetics and mechanics in the world. They don't have many moving parts, but they really do represent uh, an extraordinary integrated design objective. The design endpoints that we seek range from procedural, can we get it in, deliverability, that matters certainly to all of us, to biological, can we inhibit restenosis? Can we allow endothelialization and healing? And ultimately to clinical, do we relieve angina, reduce MI, or ideally even get to the point where we can say we reduce mortality mm -hmm. even beyond just STEMI interventions. The design targets for novel aspects of the stent platform, the drug, the delivery system, polymer or other are many, but we have to stay respectful that it's the combination effect where changes to one component may actually affect others, where small changes like strut thickness or the polymer or the drug or the dose or the kinetics may result in big outcome changes, but ultimately it's the data that tells us whether these are big outcome changes for the better or for the worse. That's really interesting, Mitch. I mean, it's amazing how complicated these devices are. You know, what's, what I found fascinating about your presentation is the fact that there are so many trials with, an act, with a, quote, active control. You know, many of the trials that you presented have compared one DES versus another DES. So despite all the hand-wringing about the thresholds for approval in the device world, we don't see that often in pharma. We don't often see an active drug versus another active drug. Is that a product of FDA requirements? Is it a product of the companies themselves making a gamble that their new product is, is better than what's out there? What's going on there? Well, why are they willing to take that risk where we don't see it very often in the pharma world? So I'm going to actually give a little credit to the clinical community because while I, I know we, we have to credit the industry, they mm -hmm. support this stuff and they're willing to, to go forward in this, at the same time, a lot of these are investigator-initiated studies. Mm -hmm. Even the randomized head-to-head -head studies are many, in many cases, post-market studies. So they were not thresholds for approval. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to think there's actually a synergy between uh, manufacturers saying, okay, I know I now have doctors who, if I'm going to win this market, I have to prove it with data. Mm -hmm. And doctors who are saying, you know, these, these devices have all kinds of different claims and flavor mixes. I want to know which one really is better. Mm -hmm. You know, the other thing that I find uh, extremely interesting about the landscape when we start talking about safety 
is that it appears at least at a 10,000 foot level that the overall rates of stem thrombosis are going down. Do you think that's because we're paying more attention to it and we're selecting patients perhaps who are uh, at lower risk? Or is there something really about the evolution of the design that's making the stent safer? I think it's probably multifactorial, and I think both of the things you mentioned are probably key. I think uh, physician attention to uh, deployment being meticulous, greater use of IVUS, I, I think uh, bears some responsibility. I do think that there is evidence, at least from the first generation to the second generation, as we see it in U.S. terms, mm -hmm. that these are safer now in the second generation than in the first, and which component contributes to that or the whole package yeah. at the end of the day, I think, is safer. I think the other thing that really gets some credit, though, is that we're at least using the same definition of stent thrombosis mm -hmm. now across the board. There are more than 500 published articles on more than a dozen stent platforms that all use the same academic research consortium ARC definition since 2006, 2007. And I think that helps us learn and understand yeah. much more comprehensively mm -hmm. that the point you just made is real. This is not, uh, this is not. It's not an artifact of definition. Exactly. The other thing that uh, is, you know, someone like you has been so involved in this in this world. Talk a little bit about how how the the, the hurdles have changed. You know, are, are we interested in different endpoints now for these spent trials than we used to be? Is it? It's not about late loss anymore. It's about clinical endpoints. Talk about the duration of follow up and how that's changed and how, in some ways, I, perhaps uh, as an outsider, I could say that even the regulatory bodies have learned as we've learned uh, with these new stent designs. Absolutely, and. and for better or for worse, I think there's a bit of a conundrum here because, in fact, what we have learned is that the upfront behavior of these devices, reducing restenosis, we've gotten pretty good at. Mm -hmm. And frankly, a lot of discrimination is going to be hard to come by beyond where we are uh, with Zion's Promise and maybe with Endeavor Resolute mm -hmm. today. The real challenge, and again, most of these designs, bioabsorbable polymer, lowered exposure to polymer, abluminal, bioresorbability in general, these are all related to safety. And safety in stent terms were 0.6% to show a 50% reduction. Mm -hmm. You're talking about 15,000 patients. And to show it at what time point, at three years, so the conundrum becomes, are we going to bog down new drug eluting stent platform innovation if we require 15,000 patient randomized trials with three years of follow-up before new devices are approved, we're not going to see new devices. Mm -hmm. So somewhere in here, I think we really have to step back. The uh, ability, you know, we have so much more sensitivity to detect safety signals in the real world practice environment these days. Mm -hmm that you can't escape. This is not something we can just duck and hide. On the other hand, I do think we have to respect that when the industry looks at something like 15,000 or Wall Street and the investment community who have small, frequently the, the locus of the real breakthrough stuff is small little companies mm -hmm. who put all of they've got into one great idea. If the investment community won't invest in those people because they know this is gonna be $120 million worth of clinical trials, before they get anywhere near approval, then we've, we've actually shot ourselves in the foot. So it clearly does warrant better and longer term attention to much rarer but mm -hmm. catastrophic safety issues. That's the vast majority of design advance in mm -hmm. DES is focused on safety. But as a whole community and as a whole innovation ecosystem, I think all the stakeholders have to put their heads together mm -hmm. on how do we keep that safety orientation from bogging us down so deeply that we will never see much innovation in this area again. Last point, in that same sort of context of safety and, and forcing people to, to collaborate, tell us a little bit of the backstory behind DAPT. This is a really special trial, the way it was designed, the collaboration that's going on, that a lot of people may not be aware uh, of how this entire, entire trial sort of came to be and, and all the people that are involved in, in getting the data uh, going. Well, I think uh, DAPT was born of a dialogue in a critical path program we call the Cardiac Safety Research mm -hmm. Consortium. And the CSRC is a, a, a collaborative, pre-competitive focus 
that involves leaders in industry, both drug and device, from the regulatory FDA side, both drug and device, and from the academic community. And ultimately, by the time of DAPT, had even expanded beyond the U.S. into the European and Japanese regulators, manufacturers, and, and academics. And again, to understand stent thrombosis, if we're talking about following thousands of patients for three to five years, this is just not something that any one company can or should have to do as a randomized trial, particularly pre-market. On the other hand, as a public health concern, you can't escape this. And, and I, so it sort of, we saw it as everybody's business. So we focused on creating a dialogue between everybody. And at the end of that dialogue, I think, was a collaboration of six pretty highly competitive drug and device manufacturers mm -hmm who were willing to step up to the plate. The FDA, who was willing to do this. Interestingly, this is a double-blind, randomized drug trial that's being conducted under the Center for Devices as an IDE because it's going to inform device labeling. Laura Mori up at Harvard and Dean Kariakis are the co-PIs, so we have the highest level academic leadership. The HCRI up at Harvard is coordinating the trial, so it's being very independently managed. And hopefully this is a model of how we can, in fact, work for public health type issues with regard to safety without saddling or, even worse, preventing industry from continuing innovation. Yeah, it's really a remarkable effort, and I think everyone's looking forward to that study and certainly uh, other things to come from the CSRC construct that you've been so instrumental in developing. Well, this has been a terrific program. Uh, my guest faculty today has been Dr. Mitch Krukoff, one of my colleagues here at Duke. Mitch, thanks again for joining us for a terrific presentation, really a great discussion on th great things to come from the stent world. Until next time then, from all of us here at Duke, this is Sunil Rao saying thanks for joining us and take care. <laughs>